Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, today we are going to be talking about asphalt paving. And this class is called Asphalt Paving Basics. It's one that I do in person sometimes, sometimes as a webinar. But the webinar has two parts. So part one will be today. We'll be talking about um, equipment and preparation and things we need to know before the actual paving project gets started. Um, so I appreciate all of you attending. We've got a good group from uh, all over the country. So lots of folks in attendance. Um, let's see, let me move here and just go over the webinar controls really quickly. I know a lot of you have probably attended these type of webinars before. Uh, but you do have the little control panel that you can expand or collapse using the red or orangey colored box with the arrow. All of you are currently in listen only mode, so your button should show up as muted. You can choose to go full screen uh, to see the presentation, but if you prefer, if you have a different screen size or whatever, you can also undo the full screen option and that will bring up the zoom and you can adjust that to fit as you need it. Now, um, on the audio options, um, probably most of you are listening via computer, but if something happens and that is no longer working, uh, there's a phone call option. You should be able to click in that box to access that number. And then I do want to point your attention mainly to the handouts. This is just an example screen, but on your actual control panel, you should have two handouts. One of those is going to be the handout that's just the presentation that I'm showing on screen today, so you'll have those slides. And then there's also a set of cal calculation worksheets. Um, so both of those are available for you to download. Just click those, um, download them, save them, use them however you need to. And then most importantly, I would like to point your attention to the questions pod. And that is where you can put in questions or comments or things. Um, if you think of a question at any time, just pop those in the questions pod. Uh, depending on the version that you're using, you may also be able to use the chat pod. So put any questions, comments at any time. We will be pausing periodically to go through that list of questions and make sure we address all of the things that you guys want to know. My name is Stacy Williams. I'm the director of the Center for Training Transportation Professionals at the University of Arkansas and on faculty of the Civil Engineering Department. Um, we've also got Tally Faulkner here with us. He's doing tech support and will be managing that questions pod. And he is the one that you need to send an email to if you're having any issues during the webinar. Um, and then this is a program, uh, the Arkansas LTAP program partners with, uh, we've got RDOT, we've got CTTP, the University of Arkansas, so an, a good collaborative effort to put these programs together. But within that, we have what's called the Road Scholar Program, where you will get two hours of credit for this particular webinar. You will receive a certificate of attendance, and that will include PDHs if you're a professional engineer. Um, that will be a benefit to you. Um, and then if you are attending as a group, I know a number of you, when you registered, you listed some extra folks that were going to attend with you. If you would, just send me an email after the webinar is over and let me know who did attend with you. And that way I can make sure everyone in attendance is able to get that certificate. And then just um, shout out to Patrick Thomas. He is the RDOT um, program manager for the Arkansas LTAP program. So if you have other questions about the program itself, he would be the one to answer those for you. All right, I want to start off with a quick poll question. I'm going to launch that real quick. You should see on your screen. Uh, does your agency contract out paving projects or do you perform them in house? Or maybe some of you do some of both or maybe you don't know. All right, it looks like most of you have voted. And I'm going to go ahead and close that poll now. I can share the responses with you. Uh, we've got almost half that contract out, almost the other half that do both. A few do in-house and a few aren't sure about that. So good, we've got a good cross-section 
uh, where we're going to be seeing both sides of things. So what I want to point out, though, about this webinar is understanding how it works. I'm not teaching you how to run a paver or how to actually run the roller, but it's general information that you need to have during a paving project, whether you're the one that's actually doing some of the work or you're simply inspecting, watching, uh, maybe you're an estimator. There are lots of different aspects of the project and it's going to be helpful for you to have an understanding of all these parts of the process so that you can um, do your best to make the best paving project possible. Now today we are mainly going to focus on the equipment and the preparation for the project. So we're going to be talking a lot about the equipment that's going to include the plant, the trucks, the paver, the roller. Um, but we are working with asphalt. And I know some of you attended a webinar a couple of weeks ago on just um, Asphalt 101, some of the basics. And we talked about how asphalt is a flexible pavement. It is rocks and oil, but that's a little bit of a, it sounds simple, but it's a little bit of an issue sometimes to get all of those details worked out where it behaves in a way that we want it to. So part of how we can control the ultimate performance of this product is how we do the construction process. So that's what we're aiming at today. Now also thinking about the pavement structure itself. The layers that form that pavement structure is not just the asphalt on top. It's also uh, maybe a crushed stone base. I may have multiple layers of asphalt on top of that. But then also we have to consider the subgrade. So during our pavement design, when we're designing that structure, we're considering the traffic loadings and the environmental effects that affect the top of that pavement structure, and then the support that we're getting from those underlying layers, such as the subgrade and the base. So all of that comes together to try to get us that best possible product. So again, in terms of pavement quality, we think about the materials, the mix design, the thickness, the subgrade, traffic, weather, and construction. We're obviously going to be focusing on the construction aspects of that, but all the way through the process, consistency is going to be incredibly important. So when you think about the materials that are going into that mixture, we're going to combine different sizes of aggregates that are going to mesh together and then basically be glued together with that oil or binder that's going to kind of seal that together. So as we mix it, we place it, all of the behaviors of these materials are going to affect that construction process to some extent. All right, so once we have our mix figured out, that mix is going to be made at the plant. So at the plant, um, you're going to start with those raw materials. So we've got uh, the different aggregate sources. Those aggregates have probably been crushed and then stockpiled in different sections. And we have different kinds of aggregate because that, that slide just a couple of slides ago that showed the different sizes of aggregate, we want a certain combination. And so we're going to put together different types of aggregates that give us that target gradation, that target structure within the mix. So we need to take care of those aggregates and make sure that they are of the best quality possible and that they don't have contamination, that type of thing. So if we can cover those stockpiles, that's wonderful. I know a lot of plants don't have the, the ability to do that, but if you can place your stockpiles on a paved surface with a little bit of a slope, so when it rains on them, we want as much water to get out of that stockpile as possible. Um, obviously, having a cover over it is going to keep some of that moisture out. But the drier the aggregates are, the faster they're going to dry during the time that they go through the dryer drum at the plant. That's going to save us some burner fuel. It's going to increase plant production. Those are all good things. Um, and then, of course, reducing contamination. Anytime we reduce the variability of the materials in the mix, we're going to have a better quality, more consistent mix. Now those aggregates are going to go from the stockpiles and be loaded into cold feed bins. So these bins are going to be uh, one container basically for one type of aggregate. And then the controls of the plant we can meter in what percent of each type of aggregate. So I might have a combination of say three different aggregate types that blend together to make that job mix formula. That means I would use three different bins 
And so you might hear that called a three bin mix. We could also have a four bin mix or five or six or any number, but usually it's somewhere between four and six different components. So your plant has to be set up to handle the number of components or different types of aggregate that are gonna fit together to make that blend. And, and then uh, I'll back up, if you have additional materials like recycled materials, your wrap or RAS, then you're gonna need additional bins for that, for it to be metered in at the correct percentage. Now the binder is gonna be stored in tanks and we're gonna typically order that. It's gonna be delivered to the plant. Make sure that you're following the manufacturer's instructions for temperature and for storage. Make sure that you don't overheat that. Many of our binders have a polymer modification, which is extra chemical goodies that go into that binder to make it behave the way we want it to. If we don't follow those temperature requirements, we could kind of mess up that combination. We could actually overheat it and cook some of that out. That's the expensive part that we paid for. We don't want to lose that. So make sure that whatever those manufacturer's instructions are that we're following that because we paid a lot of money for this product and we want to make sure that it does the best job that it can. Okay, now these materials are going to be mixed together at the plant. There are a couple of different, generally two different types of plants. One is a batch plant and this is basically a plant that's going to make one batch of asphalt at a time. So we put in uh, however many aggregate types, we put the binder in with that at its prescribed percentage it mixes that up, we've got one batch, and that can go into a truck or it can go into a silo and then eventually out to the job. On the other hand, we might have a drum plant, which is a continuous mixing plant. So instead of just making one batch at a time, we're continually making this mix. And there are some specific uh, differences in how those plants might be set up. But just think of it as we're constantly making this mix. It's going to go into some sort of a storage container to either be loaded directly into trucks or usually it's going to go into silos. We're going to load from there. But it's constantly making this product. So we're getting more production. So higher rates can be achieved. Um, this is usually a bigger setup, something that's been more of a permanent location, whereas a batch plant might be what you see if you're gonna bring in a smaller plant for a temporary setup for a particular job, perhaps. Now, in the continuous mixing type setup, we're gonna see some uh, different schemes or schematics of how this works. So the first step is that the aggregates get loaded into the bins, the bins meter that material into the dryer drum. So what you see is on the right-hand side of the screen, we've got uh, the little flame there, that's where the heat is applied at the end of that drum. That's where the aggregates go in because those aggregates need to be dry. All of our design work was done based on those aggregate particles being completely dry. There's no more evaporation that can happen, all that kind of thing. So we're assuming in the plant, we're achieving that same goal of those aggregates being dry. So if it's a nice, hot, dry summer day, that's not gonna take very long. If it's later on in the fall, it's kind of cooler, it's rained recently and those aggregates were not covered, um, then it's gonna take a little longer for that to happen. But that flame comes in from one end, dries the aggregates, and then about halfway or so down that barrel, we've got the input where the binder is added to the aggregate. And then that is all mixed together. At the end of the drum, the mix comes out. So it should be, nice and consistent, and it should match those prescribed per percentages from our job mix formula. Now, a counterflow, we're going to see that that flame moves to a different area there within the drying. It's going to be on the end of the drying portion. So we've got the dryer drum, the aggregates go in, but the flame's on the other end. There's also a little bit of a drop down here, and that's where the binder is going to be added in. So we have a definite sequential change from the drying area to the mixing area and that flame is going to be right there at the intersection of the two so that the heat can be uh, kind of dispersed a little bit more between the drying and the mixing. 
And then on a double barrel, this is, uh, some of this just what you choose has to do with the space that you have available and what you can manage. But in this layout, what we're seeing is that the aggregates go in one end, the flame is on the other end of the dryer drum, and there's actually two layers of the drum. So the inside drum is where the aggregate goes in. Once it makes its way down to the end, the aggregate should be dry, and then it's gonna be transferred to the outer drum, and it will actually tumble around the outside of that dryer drum, and that's where the binder is added and it all gets mixed together, and then it comes out kind of back on the, the end, closer to where the aggregates were introduced to that drum in the first place. So a little bit uh, shorter real estate need for that layout. Now, what do these things look like? On the inside of a dryer drum, you'll see all these flights, all these little metal uh, veins that are there. They have certain angles. A lot of study goes into how best to shape those different veins and flights to make sure that we tumble the aggregates, evenly apply the heat, and make sure that everything is getting mixed as well as possible. So we do all of the mixing there, and then um, we should have the output being that mixture, which is the aggregates and the asphalt cement that's together. But how fast can we go? Well, that is gonna be affected by a lot of things. Now, if you are making batches and taking those directly to a plant, you really need to think this through all the way from the start to the finish of how we're using that asphalt. A continuous drum plant or any plant that's got silos, you can make it, save it for later, but just keep in mind that the speed is gonna affect your production rate. So you need to think about how much mix you need, how fast it needs to be delivered to the job site and lots of things to, to balance. Now the aggregate temperature, again, we gotta make sure we're getting it hot enough to get all of the moisture out. And then there's also on our mix design gonna be a mixing temperature and a compaction temperature. That mixing temperature is generally based on the temperature viscosity curve for the binder, okay, or that asphalt cement. That is what should be happening at the plant. So mixing is happening at the plant. That's the temperature that we want everything. So when we're putting those aggregates in the dryer drum, we're trying to get those aggregates up to that mixing temperature, and then we're adding the binder. That means it's gonna be uh, thin enough liquid that it evenly coats the aggregates. So how long do, does the aggregate need to stay in the dryer drum? Again, it's a function of how wet the aggregate is, how fast things can move, and then how long does it need to mix with the binder? Okay, we just need to mix until we have good complete coatings. Now, if you look in the picture on the right side of the screen, there's a lot of variability in color. There's some black, there's some white, there's some gray, there's some tan. I shouldn't see anything but black. So everything should be coated. And you can see this is a, a horrendous picture. If you ever saw this in the field, send that back. But I should not see uncoated particles. If I see that, that means I'm trying to rush that plant too much. I'm pushing out mix without really giving it a chance for those aggregates to get coated with the binder. So we wanna make sure that everything looks very, very consistent. So I never wanna see this marbly look with all the different colors. Everything should look exactly the same. Right now, silos. I mentioned that this could be used for storage and it's a heated storage for the mix. So as you, let's say you've had a really big drum plant and you're just blowing and going and making asphalt as fast as you can go, if the trucks aren't there yet or the project's not ready for it, you've got to store that. What this also gives you the ability to do is to make different mixes. You might have a Fiji 64 mix in silo number one, you might have a 70 minus 22 in silo number two, and you can kind of pre-make some of the mix that you know you're going to need later that day and then be able to load trucks accordingly depending on what project they're going to. So from a production standpoint, you can really multitask and get a lot of things done. Now things to watch out for in the silo, um, just make sure that you're not keeping it in the silo for too long. Um, watch out for drain down. You can see it's kind of a vertical tank. So if we're putting mix in, and it's got that liquid binder on it, there's a chance that some of that could kind of ooze and move down 
toward the bottom of the silo. So if we were to fill that silo and not do anything with it for a few hours, you probably will see some drain down, which means the bind or the, the mixture that gets loaded into the truck from the bottom of the silo may have more asphalt content than what was intended on the mix design because some of that extra is just kind of run down and, and sits there. So if you're having inconsistencies in your binder content, one thing to look at is what's happening in the silo. How long is the mix staying there? Um, how can you even out that production rate, your truck timing, and all of that to make sure you're getting the freshest, most appropriately proportioned material possible. All right, so after the mix is made at the plant, we've got to get it out to the job sites. So we're going to talk about those haul trucks. Um, the in-dump type of dump truck is probably most common in this part of the country. I know in other areas, there might be some belly dumps, conveyor, uh, live bottom trucks, that type of thing. Um, in Arkansas, for sure, almost always, we're going to see an in-dump. Most of those are going to be around the 15-ton capacity range, bigger projects might use 20 ton trucks and for local agencies smaller outfits might use 12 ton trucks. Um, it is important if you are using a dump truck to haul asphalt temperature is a big deal. It's very important that we maintain the proper temperature and I mentioned that compaction temperature in addition to the mixing temperature we mix it at the plant at a certain temperature and the compaction temperature is what what it needs to be when it's at the job site being placed. And there's a difference in those two numbers that should account for how much cooling will happen between the plant and the job site. So we want to make sure not to lose too much heat. If it cools off too much, it's going to be extremely difficult or impossible to compact properly. So we need to make sure that those trucks are insulated. And then also, not only for temperature concerns, but also for safety, they do need to be tarped. So they should be covered as they head out to the job site. In terms of truck maintenance, um, pay attention to all the working parts of the truck. You're going to have trucks backing up to the paver that need to, to dump that mix into the hopper. So we've got to have brakes that are sensitive enough to make that happen without bumping the paver. I mean, they need to be sensitive enough that you can lightly press the brakes to maintain contact with the paver as that uh, transfer is happening. Uh, make sure the steering is sensitive enough that you can get exactly where you need to be and line up with the paver properly. Make sure you're not leaking any fluids like hydraulic fluid, oils, that kind of thing. Those are uh, at least partially going to be petroleum products and they are really not good for the asphalt. So if you were to spill some type of hydraulic fluid on the ground in front of where the paving is happening, that's a future problem just waiting to happen. In terms of the bed, uh, these dump truck beds take a lot of abuse. We're putting a lot of really heavy stuff in them. And so between the rail support rails, uh, you kind of see some dips in the different sections of the truck. Try to make sure that if there's anything you can do to keep that smooth, that's going to help prevent trapping mix in those low spots. So we don't want to keep old mix to be contaminated uh, or to contaminate that new mix. And then just make sure all the, the lights and the blinkers and all the safety features of the truck are working. And make sure that you're keeping the truck clean. But by clean, uh, use an approved solvent that can take care of uh, cleaning up the asphalt, which means no diesel. Diesel is not an approved material to use for cleaning. It is a lighter cut of that petroleum, same as asphalt, and it will actually eat the asphalt off of, it eats those coatings off of the rocks. So this is an example of where that did happen, this was actually a spill, but it was diesel and it did start to disintegrate uh, part of that mix. That section had to be cut out and replaced. Now, the other thing that we're going to talk about a little more later is that we've got to figure out how many trucks we need. Everything about asphalt paving hinges on having the highest level of consistency. So you're going to hear me say that word a lot. Um, but think about how far is it from the plant to the job site? 
how much traffic is there along that route? So how long is it taking that truck to get from point A to point B with the mix? How fast can the, the plant produce the mix? Um, how thick is the mat? The thicker your paving, the more mix you need to get in a short amount of time. And then one other comment I would make is to think about what day is it? Is it hunting season? Is it a really nice fishing day? What level of driver commitment do you have? I know sometimes if it's uh, a Friday or a Monday, sometimes some folks call in and they're gonna take the day off and they're not driving that day. Make sure you have enough folks on call that you can maintain the number of trucks that you need to keep this process moving smoothly. All right, and at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and take a quick break. Tally, do we have any questions online? Hey, good afternoon, afternoon everybody. Um, as of right now, we don't have any questions. If you do, please feel free to get those posted in the questions pod and we'll get to them as we move along. All right, very good. I'm gonna move on now to the paver itself. This is the part that does the biggest job, I guess. Um, the paver is a vehicle or tractor unit. Um, it's really got two parts. There's the tractor unit and then there's the screed that follows along behind it. So the tractor unit has the drive system. You can have a rubber tired one, you can have a track system. Um, the rubber tire ones are usually a little bit smaller. They're ballasted to reduce the amount of bounce that you would get from those rubber tires. Uh, these types are usually a little bit easier, more user friendly to get from place to place or from if you're doing driveways and you're trying to get from point A to point B, you don't wanna have to trailer it to get it to that next location. Uh, the larger pavers are typically going to be on tracks. You do have better weight distribution with those, but it does require a trailer to move it any considerable distance. Now, the screed is attached to the paver, the tractor unit, and it is a free floating. Uh, it sounds kind of silly because the screed is really, really heavy, but it's attached at a, a tow point, and that tow point is like a pivot point that allows the screed to kind of float along on the mix that is pushed out from the back of the paver. Here's a picture of a paver and you can see that front portion is the tractor unit. Over on the right side you can see the tracks and then this portion in the back that's going to be the screed. And again there's a lot of weight that's applied from the screed and that's actually going to give us our very initial level of compaction during the paving process. Now the tractor unit on the front has a hopper. That hopper is going to receive the mix and then there are slat conveyors that move the mix from the front of the paver to the back and then there's an auger system that's going to split that mix and move it from end to end or side to side to go all the way across the width of the screed. So if we're paving say a 12-foot lane that screed is going to be set to a 12-foot width and those augers are gonna turn and push the mix to evenly distribute it across that entire 12 foot width. Now let's look a little more closely at the hopper. This is where we're receiving the mix from the truck. So the dump, dump truck backs up, dumps the material into the hopper, and this is just kind of the holding tank for the paver. Uh, your hopper does need to be wide enough for the truck body to fit between the two edges. So sometimes there's some give and take on what paver you use might determine whether you can use the 12 ton or the 20 ton haul trucks. Um, make sure that your hopper is low enough that the truck bed can fully raise without sitting on the hopper. You don't want that paver to have to bear the weight of the truck. And then as you're going through the paving process, that hopper has wings, so the sides will fold up. And essentially what's happening is we fill up that hopper, we're using the mix, and the stuff on the edges is not necessarily hitting those slack conveyors to be moved to the back. So we fold it up to let that fall down and move through to the center part of the paper. The wings also keep uh, mix from falling out, the wing guards. And one, if you look in the back of the paper, it's kind of just a box, and then we fold up the edges. And back in that corner, it's a 90 degree angle. 
uh, some folks will weld a little angled piece of metal there that will kind of funnel the mix to that back center portion. And that helps keep kind of losing some of those chunks that get cooled off and stay stuck in there for too long. But we wanna make sure that we're keeping that mix from getting segregated. Segregated means like the coarse aggregate particles kind of all gather up and the fine particles gather up and they're not evenly mixed. We need that consistent product. So we want everything to be mixed together and be extremely homogeneous and consistent looking. So if we start to notice that what we're doing with the hopper is creating some segregation, then I wanna change that. All right, the slat conveyor is basically just going to be the slats that are going to push the material from the hopper and pull it back toward the screen through that tunnel. There are two sides of the conveyor and those two are going to operate independently. If you are paving and everything is completely consistent from side to side, then those are going to operate, they're independent, but they would look the same. But let's say that you had a super elevated segment where the outside edge of the pavement actually needed to be thicker than the inside edge, then uh, you could use the independent operation to push more mix to the outside to make sure that that side is thicker. Or at the same time, what if you had uh, a cross slope, you know, like crown section, you're doing the lane, so maybe the inside edge needs to be a little thicker than the outside, or you're trying to taper that to meet curb and gutter requirements, something like that. If you need different amounts of mix throughout the width of the lane, then you're gonna feed that a little bit differently on the two sides. So the flow gates are gonna control the amount of mix. And I will say most folks are using a fairly automatic paver. And so a lot of this just kind of happens automatically for you. Right now in the augers, there's a pair of screw augers that again are going to distribute that mix across the width of the mat. And the amount has to be balanced across the screen. So if you imagine it comes through the paver, comes through the tunnel, it's all in the middle. So as these augers turn, it pushes it to the outside edge. We also have to worry about that center point because if we push everything to the edges, we want to make sure that there's not a gap in the middle. So there are paddles that are tucked underneath that gearbox that are gonna fill in that center area. So uh, that's something to keep an eye on during inspection, make sure that the texture is even from side to side so that everything is running consistently. Make sure you're not getting a gap right there in the middle of the lane. As far as the height of the mix, we wanna keep it at or slightly above the center of the screw augers. So you should never see the bottom half um, and it should never cover the top half. So adjust that gate or conveyor speed to maintain a consistent feed level. And so if you look in these pictures, you can see that we see the, the edges of the auger, the, the screw part that sticks out, but we don't see the bar that runs through the middle. That should be covered with mix. All right, and then the screed. After the auger spreads it out, the screed is gonna smash it down. So the screed establishes our initial thickness and texture. Now again, the screed is free floating, so it's connected by a toe point or a pin connection on each side of the paver. And there are cylinders there also that can make adjustments to that. Now your screed has to be heated. Actually, everything on the paver needs to be hot. The mix is coming in hot. We wanna maintain that temperature as much as possible. Um, so just make sure that everything is helping maintain the appropriate compaction temperature as you go. Now, screed operations, a lot of it's gonna depend on where the toe point is. Again, it's on a cylinder, uh, and that toe point is actually up in the middle of the tractor. So if you think about pulling a trailer, if you've got a pickup truck and a trailer with a bumper hitch, then that's your, your inflection point. If you go uphill or you go downhill. But on the paver, these toe points actually are up in the middle of that tractor unit. So that's gonna change a little bit of how this works. So think through that and we'll talk about that some more. But the toe point can be adjusted 
um, again, manual or automatic, depending on your paver type. Now back here, it's where the auger is. You can see that head of mix is just above the center point. The arm that connects the screed to the tractor unit is the screed arm, also called the leveling arm. There's our toe point, and that's the cylinder that we talked about where we can make those adjustments. Okay. And then the bottom of the screed, which is the area that comes in contact with the, the asphalt mat, that is the screed plate. And that needs to be smooth, needs to not have any boogered up sections on it that are going to drag and leave texture in the mat. We want that to be nice and smooth. But the front edge of that plate is really what's going to take the brunt of the force, and that's a strike off section. So that strike off is going to sit just a little above level and be able to push that down and compact the correct amount of mix underneath the screed plate. At the ends, um, on the side to side, on those edges of the screed, you're going to have an end gate. And that's going to set the dimensions for the width of paving. And those are typically uh, just vertical little panels on the edge. Now, from time to time, we need to make some adjustments on thickness. And some of our specifications will say they will be dependent on thickness. So we're getting paid to place, say, two inches of a surface mix on a particular roadway, or maybe it's two and a half. But whatever that is, we may be getting paid based on the actual thickness. So I need to be able to adjust if something's not right, of course. So different ways I can do things. I can actually raise uh, that toe point. So if you pick up on the front, what's that going to do? It's going to kind of rock it back. So think about pulling a trailer again. If you lift it in the front, the back end is probably going to go down. But if you're pushing enough mix under the screed, it's actually going to rise up over that. So if I need to increase mat, the mat thickness, I can raise the toe point, increase the material feed. And another way that I can affect the thickness is by changing the temperature. If the temperature goes down, it's a little harder to compact. It doesn't squish as easily. So if my temperature goes down, I can expect to see a little bit thicker mat. Now, that is not a way that I would want to intentionally make that change, but it is a way that you can troubleshoot. Uh, you know, our thickness has changed. It doesn't look like we really changed anything else. Why is this different? Check your temperature. And if it's cooling down, it's harder to compact, which will result in a little bit of extra thickness. Now, for decreasing map thickness, everything's the opposite. If I lower that toe point, my screed, uh, that strike off is going to dig down a little bit more into the mix and that's going to be a thinner layer so the screed will move down also if i decrease the material feed rate then i don't have as much mix going under the screed and it's going to compact it more um, it'll be a little thinner and then same thing with temperature if i am getting loads that are hotter than they have been that hotter material means the binder is a little more liquidy it's going to compact easier. So that's another thing that might affect some of those changes that we see with the thickness. Now, keep in mind, if you raise your toe point and you do kind of rock that back, we're going to put a lot of pressure on the back edge. And we may have some extra wear that we didn't intend to have on the back edge of the screen plate. At the same time, if you lower that and you don't adjust your attack angle, then you're going to put some extra wear on that strike off plate. And the paper speed can also affect the amount of mix that's being delivered to the mat. So if you've set your, your paver and it's pushing mix through at a certain rate, and you don't change that rate, but you speed up, that means the same amount of mix is having to cover a larger area. Therefore, it has to be thinner. If you slow the paper down and you keep the feed rate constant, then you're actually going to increase the thickness of the mat. You've got more mix being shoved under there and you're not making as much uh, forward progress. So your area 
is actually smaller. Now, most of our automatic pavers are gonna make adjustments for that. Um, if you do have an older paver, just keep in mind that all of these things interact. And if you change one without considering another, you may have some unintended consequences. And then also your feed rate can affect the angle of attack. Now, what I mean there is how the screed plate, uh, that strike off area hits the mix. We want it to be fairly level, but not completely. It needs to have just a little bit of a rise in the front to make that strike off. Uh, but if it's really rocked back or really digging down, leaning forward, that's gonna cause a lot of extra wear on the paper or on the screed. All right, now thickness control screws. This is back on the screed, and this is basically a crank that you can turn to adjust the depth or the thickness of the mat. Uh, one full turn typically will change the depth by about a quarter of an inch. It also will change the attack angle. Uh, now, we said there are a lot of other things you can do at the toe point and all those other things to change that. So think about this. If your paver operator makes a change at the toe point, at the same time your screed man turns the crank on the back, you've made two changes. So make sure those two guys are in very close communication of what type of change needs to be made to affect that desired depth. I know that some of the newer papers are now don't come with a crank on the back. Everything is controlled by the paper operator up on the tractor unit. Um, and then also keep in mind that grade changes can definitely interfere with your thickness adjustments. So if you, you're just going along, everything's flat, even, the same, very consistent, but you know, you're running a little off on your depth, you make an adjustment and then suddenly start going uphill. Think about that interaction like the trailer hitch. How is that change going to affect the screed? And it will definitely change it. Uh, so make sure that you're aware that grade changes can interfere with those adjustments. So in a sense, that's making two changes at the same time. So when you go from a flat to a grade, I would not make any thickness adjustments right then because you want to know what change had what effect. Changing two things at the same time makes that impossible to figure out. So thickness control, you can already tell that is kind of a, a delicate thing to balance. The other issue here is that we've got that leveling arm. You know, it's not like a, a pickup truck trailer hitch. We've got that leveling arm that goes from the screed all the way up to the middle of the tractor unit. And that is usually about nine or so feet long. So we've got that, that nine foot distance from where uh, those cylinder adjustments might be made. Nine feet behind that is where we're gonna see the impact of that adjustment. But it's gonna take some time for the screed to adjust, for everything to kind of level out. And what we really see, it's about five times the length of the leveling arms for you to truly see the impact of the change that you made. So that's about 45, say 50 feet before you can really see, did that change work? Did it do what I want it to do? So if we say that we pave, I don't know, 20 feet in a minute, that is a good two, maybe two and a half minutes before we can totally see what that change really did for us. Two and a half minutes is an incredibly long time to wait when you think, okay, I just changed this. What did it do? We want that instant gratification. How did it work? And if it didn't work and we don't see it fixed immediately, it takes a lot of self-control to not make another change. Well, if I change it again and think, well, that didn't do enough. I need to change it again. It's really going to take about 50 feet to see it. So if I overreacted and changed it again too quickly, I just doubled that change. So then 75, 100 feet later, things are out of whack because I didn't wait long enough to see what was the actual effect of that change. So be very careful to not make any changes that you don't absolutely have to make. Again, we're going for consistency. So the goal is to line out your process and just go, not make any adjustments that aren't absolutely necessary. Right, and then the end gate we mentioned, those are just the side, those side walls 
on the screen. They are typically vertical. And so after you pay, you go past there. It's not it's compacted some by the screen, but it's not totally compacted. So in theory, that is a vertical edge. It kind of stands up, but it's a little crumbly. So it's vertical-ish, we'll call it. Um, there are some safety issues that can be associated with that. If you run off the edge of the road, you end up on the shoulder. If it's, you know, like a, a gravel shoulder, that kind of thing. And so the feds have a safety countermeasure that they've promoted for a number of years now called the safety edge. And if you look at the picture on the right, uh, there's actually a fixture that goes in the inside that end gate and it creates a wedge over here on the right. So it's a little bit of a slope. We get rid of that vertical drop off and have a little bit of a slope and that helps cars that end up off the edge of the road be able to travel back up onto the traveled way a little bit better. Okay, so just to further describe that, here's your normal drop off. We've got the edge of pavement, it kind of rounds down. It's kind of a vertical drop off, but we add this box inside that end gate. That's gonna give us a bit of a wedge. And so you can measure what that is, it allows cars to get back up on the main traveled way a little simpler. All right, we can adjust the width of paving. So most of our pavers have adjustable screeds and the larger ones are gonna have screed extensions. They can be rigid or hydraulic, but if you have multiple sections in your screed, then you need to make sure that everything is adjusted the same way. Everything needs to have the same elevation, the same attack angle, the augers need to be pushed out um, and extended to push mix all the way to the edges. So if you look in this picture, you can see on the screed, there's this middle section and then there's a kind of a break point where the two red arrows are pointing and those are the extensions that push out. So some of these pavers are humongous and they can pave as much as 40, 44 feet in width at a, at a time. Most of us don't have a need to do that, but it's cool that they can. Um, but yeah, if you can pave say two lanes at a time rather than one, if you can manage the traffic control, uh, that's great, do that. Um, but again, just make sure when you have those extensions that you're checking to make sure all of those three parts are behaving the same way because you don't want to have different textures. Um, and a lot of times you'll see a little bit of a streak right here at the intersection of the, at the main screen and the extensions. So you'll see that line. If that is not coming out uh, during some of that rolling, uh, you shouldn't be able to see that after the rollers hit it. If so, there might be a segregation issue or just something is out of adjustment so that something different is happening in those two spots. All right, and then grade control. We have to maintain a certain longitudinal elevation. So how thick does that pavement need to be? If it's a brand new roadway, then we've got some desired elevation. They've done all kinds of planning and geometric design to make sure that the curvature of those vertical curves is correct where we have sight distance and lots of things have happened. So we don't wanna mess that up now while we're building the actual roadway. So a lot of times though, maybe we're just resurfacing. So we're adding a couple of inches to the existing, maybe it's mill and fill. So we've dropped that down and we're gonna fill it back in. Um, if we're matching curves, that gives us some kind of a guideline. But however that is, we know that we need to have some type of control. And there are several methods to do that. There's string line, there's mobile reference, there's joint matching shoes, automated machine guidance. So let's look at a couple of those. So the string line, this is kind of our traditional, very accurate way to control grade. It is the most accurate, most I guess that's a true statement. Um, historically, it is the most accurate way, but it's not a real simple process. So you have your survey crew out there and you're setting each one of these posts so that you have a visual guide and you can see exactly how the paver needs to make that curve and at exactly what elevation uh, to put that mix at. Well, this is great until somebody runs over it or knocks it down um, sometimes curves aren't very smooth because it's not really a radius. It's actually a series of chords. So sometimes you'll see 
those little intersections may look a, a little bit weird. Uh, but the biggest thing I think is that it's easily damaged. Um, it's not necessarily other cars just getting in the construction area. It could be your haul trucks that run it over and then you've got to fix that by having someone come back out and set those elevations again. So it's pretty labor intensive. Um, it might be that in an overlay situation, we're basically trying to match a lane that's next to it or something that was there previously. And so you'll have, uh, it's basically a big long ski, anywhere from 30 to 50 feet. So you have a long distance where the ski is out on the side of the paver and it's measuring the distance down to the ground. And what this is gonna help us do, since it's a floating beam system, we're looking at overall for this long distance, this is the average elevation of what needs to be there. So the longer it is, the more deviations it can average out and give you an overall smoother ride. On the other hand, sometimes we use a short ski, like on a joint matching shoe, and that's where down in the bottom right hand corner of this picture, you can see it's just a little short section that we're matching. Well, once we match that, we are completely dependent on the thing that we're matching. So if you were to use this, say, on curb and gutter, and the concrete workers had some lumps in the concrete, it's not a big deal, it's in the curb, nobody's supposed to drive there anyway. But if we're using that as our reference, then we're going to automatically build those same bumps into the roadway. We don't want that. So any of those deviations that are there, we're going to see reflected in the elevations of the roadway itself. And then automated machine guidance, this is just cool stuff. It's the newest technology, uh, can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional, and it relies on our GPS equipment to determine where we are in the world and then connect that real time to the paver controls. So if we've got all of this set up, we can upload the file that has all of the 3D information for where the pavement's supposed to be. And then the paver does all the magic to make sure that that happens. And it's really cool. The only problem is that something's not quite right. It's really hard to tell exactly what the problem is. And then slope control. We don't always have the same elevation on the two sides of the paver, but typically we're gonna set grade on one side and then the other side is just gonna be relative. So if we're going along, we have the typical crown slope, then the center line of the pavement is gonna be slightly higher than the outer edge of the pavement. And as long as we have that reference set and we know what the offset is, everything should go fine. Um, if we have to transition to a super elevated section, make sure that you know it should be designed, all the plans should say this, but those changes need to happen gradually so that you don't make a vehicle switch from kind of lean in one way and then throw them the other way. That makes the road feel rough, even though the pavement might be fine. The picture I've got here is paving at racetrack, which is really cool. Uh, they have to tether their equipment uh, to keep it from sliding down the slope. Uh, but it is really cool to see presentations where they've gone in and resurfaced the racetracks and all the different things that they have to do there. So I'll put the picture there because it's cool. Most of us will never see anything like that. Okay. And then one other thing I would point out is when you are making those gradual changes, remember what your paper will do and what it won't do. You don't want to make a manual change and then have your automatic functions take that over and counteract what you're trying to do or duplicate what you're doing. All right, and then your steering reference, make sure that you've got some construction markings to get the, the asphalt put where it needs to go. So it needs to be something visible. Uh, you can see just the paint markings over here, just off the edge of where that lane is gonna be placed. So those are bright pink, so they're visible. And then the picture on the right, they've got a, a painted chain that hangs down. So the paver operator has a very good, good visual guide of exactly where to steer the paver. And then maintenance. Nobody really wants to do this because it's not fun, but read the manual, okay? And again, I know no one does that until something goes wrong, and then you have to go find the manual and then you look up the part you need to know. But it is really handy to read through what is the manufacturer expecting you to do. Keep up with all of that regular maintenance 
check all the parts, check the screed, make sure that you're keeping it clean. That's probably one of the biggest maintenance features of operating a paver is keeping it clean. Get that hardened asphalt away from the end gates, clean it at the end of each day. It's most, most, most easier when you can do this while the asphalt is still warm. Um, use your environmentally friendly solvents, but also pay close attention to the push rollers. That's something that we want to be smooth so that it's not impacting uh, pressures on the paver. Do your weekly checks, check the engine oil, the filter, um, all the stuff that's on the list. And then also specifically, after you've cleaned it, look for signs of wear and particularly signs of uneven wear. Okay, here's a great example of all the gunk that gets all over everything and it's asphalt. It is messy, absolutely. But right up here, you can see a lot of dribblings that have fallen on the push rollers and around the edges of the hopper wings. We wanna keep all of that as clean as possible. And particularly at the end of the day, we don't wanna to have to start tomorrow with today's mess. All right, and then one other piece of equipment that I will um, just point out here is the shuttle buggy. This is technically called a material transfer vehicle or a material transfer device. And this is basically a conveyor system to go between the truck and the paver so that you're not dumping directly into the paver hopper. Um, sometimes when the truck backs up, it will bump the paver and we definitely don't want that to happen. This is a great way to keep that from happening. So the truck backs up to the shuttle buggy, dumps into the shuttle buggy hopper, and then it remixes, keeps it heated, and then uses a conveyor system to drop that into the hopper rather than pouring it from the truck. Now, this is a wonderful technique. It's very, very effective at preventing segregation and preventing bumps in the pavement, but it is the heaviest vehicle that you'll probably see on roadway construction projects. So make sure, uh, particularly, I know a lot of you are with local agencies, so we're dealing with some of the smaller city streets that have less structure. Make sure that the street you're gonna be paving has enough structure to handle this vehicle. Okay, that's the worst thing you can do is kill the road right before you pave over it, so. All right, the next section is rollers, but I'm thinking there may be a few questions that have come in. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop and see if there's anything we need to touch base on before we move forward. Okay, okay. Um, yes, we have had a few questions come through. Um, the first one, how often should wings be emptied if not every time? Okay, very good. The hopper wings, that is a judgment call. Um, you don't need to, to fold in the wings every load for sure. Um, every few loads, but I will say that it's going to depend on the weather. The faster that your mix is cooling down, the more often you're going to need to fold them in. Uh, if it's a good, hot, sunny day, you can probably go longer, a few more loads without uh, folding those in. Okay, um, another question um, for the plant, what are typical temperatures and how will temperatures that are too cold affect compaction? Okay, great question. Um, the binder or the oil that's used in the mix is going to dictate what those temperatures are. That's something that you will find on your mix design. So if it's say a PG 64 minus 22 binder, then your typical mixing temperatures will be 310, 320, uh, maybe even 300. And then compaction temperature will be a little bit lower than that. So you might have 320 for mixing, 290 for compaction. And so uh, once you leave the plant, it's gonna start cooling down from that production or that mixing temperature. When you get out to the job site, if it's cooled down too much, then it's gonna be very difficult to compact. So think about it cooling off, it gets sticky, it gets harder. Uh, the hotter it is, the more liquid, the more workable that mix is. The colder it gets, the more stiff it is. And you have to get compaction. There's generally specifications that dictate what percent compaction you have to have at the end of the process. 
if you start with mix that's too cold, you're never going to achieve that. So typically, if you have mix coming out to the job site that's less than about 275, um, some agencies have specs that say they won't accept the truck if it gets there and the mix is cooled off below that temperature. Um, it's a judgment call, honestly. Uh, but if you're below about 275, you can expect that you're going to need some extra rollers for compaction to try to hit that really quick. So if you get too far below that intended compaction temperature, um, it's going to be tough. And let's say that you had a highly polymer modified binder, so like a PG76 minus 22, that's going to be a higher temperature where mixing is probably around 340, could be as high as 360, and then your compaction temperature might be 320, 330 even. So that's kind of the typical range that I've seen. Okay, um, a couple more. Remind me what the leveling arm was. All right, the leveling arm is that bar. It's basically your hitch. So it's the bar that attaches the screed to that midpoint in the pa in the paver where those um, cylinders are. So that's the the bar that goes between the toe point and the screed at the back of the paver. Okay, and what's the last one as of right now? In general, what percent compaction is the screed able to place? That is an awesome question. And the answer is, it depends. Um, I would say that you can generally get 75, maybe to 85% compaction with a standard paver. There are heavy duty pavers that will give you additional compaction and you might get up around the 85 to 90%. There are also high density pavers that might have a vibrating tamping bar on the screed or tamping screed, they call them. Um, I've seen that get up to like 93, 94% compaction uh, just behind the screed. That's before you put rollers on it. So it's pretty impressive. All right. Well, that looks like that's everything at this time. All right, well, we will cruise on and talk about the rollers, because after we get the mix down on the ground, the screed, uh, that's a great segue question, really. The screed give us, gives us some initial compaction, but we've got to complete that process. So our rollers are going to be either, uh, we've got several options, but typically we see steel wheel rollers out there, either single or double drum, can be articulated, which means they'll bend in the middle static uh, or vibratory. Vibratory means that those drums will vibrate and static, they don't. And so typically if you have a roller that has the vibrating drums, you can turn that off and operate it both in vibratory or static mode. And sometimes you have a roller where only one of the, the rollers is like the front may have vibe and the back doesn't, or maybe both of them do. But keep in mind, the more parts you have that move, uh, the more wear and tear you have with all of that motion and the more maintenance. So, but they also do a lot of work for you. All right, there are also pneumatic rollers. And these, you can see in the picture, there's a series of wheels. It's a rubber tired roller. You can see a wheel and a gap and a wheel and a gap. The wheels in the back of this vehicle are, there will be three and they fit in the gaps between the four that are in the front. So as you're rolling, you're kind of kneading the mix. It has a little bit more of a lateral pressure and kind of moves that mix around. So if you're having trouble getting the compaction that you want, this is sometimes a, a good extra step to add where you can move that mix around a little more and knead it into place and then bring a, a steel wheel drum back on top of it to mash it down more. Um, keep the tires heated on this. We don't want it to pick up the mix. And sometimes we just see these used for leveling courses, but the, the point here is that we're doing something that doesn't bridge. So this can help us get a little bit of extra compaction if needed. We'll most often see these used in intermediate compaction. Sometimes they're not used at all. A lot of times they're not used at all. Okay, so our rollers, again, vibratory. Um, when we start out that first initial compaction, the first roller that gets on it, it's called the breakdown roller. 
So behind the screed, we got a lot of compaction. And then we're gonna hit it hard right off the bat. This is the, the roller that's gonna hit it while it's the hottest. So we've got the most capability to add compaction. So this is where most of it's gonna happen. If we're not getting the compaction that we want, then we might bring in that pneumatic or intermediate roller for some extra uh, compaction. And then the last step is gonna be our finish rolling. And that's gonna be done in static mode. And our real purpose here, we're not really getting any more compaction at this point, but we're taking out all of the roller marks from the previous parts of the process. Now for vibratory rollers, again, our breakdown roller is gonna hit it in vibratory mode. And you can adjust on most of them, you can adjust the amplitude and you can adjust the frequency. The amplitude, we wanna use the lowest amplitude possible. Now amplitude is how much up and down motion we're seeing. Frequency is gonna be how often that drum is hitting on the pavement. The higher the frequency, the better because if you look at these little graphs, we've got low frequency on the blue line at the top, and then the red line on the second row here is high frequency. So we're hitting very often. So when I drive on that pavement, I've treated more spots the same way. That's what I'm aiming at. I want everything to be consistent. Now, both of those examples have fairly low amplitude, so we know high frequency is better, but if that's not giving me enough compaction, then what I wanna do is crank up the amplitude. I do not want to trade high amplitude for low frequency. This would be terrible. I would compact it more here at the bottom of this curve than I would in the gap in between. And sometimes you can feel that when you drive on it. When you drive on a roadway and it kind of sings to you and you can hear that, that hum or that whine, some of that is the frequency that we just built into the texture. Sometimes you can actually feel the vibration itself. Now, if you uh, tried the second row, high frequency, low amplitude, it didn't work, skip on down to the bottom row. We want high frequency and high amplitude. That way I'm doing the same amount of compaction uh, at a closer spacing, so it's gonna be more consistent. We typically wanna see about one impact per inch. Uh, so Impacts per foot should be 10 to 12. And I thought that was on this slide, but somehow it is gone. So 10 to 12 impacts per foot, which is approximately one per inch is what we would like to see. Your tire footprint's gonna be nine, 10 inches of actual contact area. So that will bridge that out. But if you've got a big spacing, you will feel that. Now, the other thing to know here is uh, about compaction. We talk about passes and we talk about coverages. So rolling patterns are going to be set up so that you know how many times do I need to pass over a certain point to get the right amount of compaction, okay? When is good enough is usually what we're looking for. A pass means that the entire roller moves over one point on the mat one time. But if your roller is not as wide as the entire lane or that mat, then you're gonna to have to make multiple passes to get a complete coverage over the width. So the coverage is the roller moving over the entire width of the mat one time. All right, and we already stopped. I don't know if we have any other questions at this point, but I have a slide for it, so we can do that. Okay, yep, looks like no more additional questions at this point. And um, you know, like we said earlier, feel free to get those posted if you have any that comes up. All right, very good. So now we're gonna move on to a portion uh, where we look at some calculations because we've gotta balance out all of the equipment that we're gonna be using on the project. So we have the plant, we've talked about that, we've talked about the trucks, we've talked about the paver, and we've talked about the rollers. Now the plant, typically we know there's just one. And then the paver, I'd be surprised if we have a whole lot of jobs that have multiple pavers. So that one would kind of know there's one of each, but we need to figure out how many trucks do we need and what do we need for our compaction? How many rollers? We need probably a breakdown and a finish, but do I need multiples of any of those? So 
let's look at how we would figure that out. So to start with, I've got just some kind of background information. One of the things we need to do is figure out our stationing or the length. And this is, uh, some agencies use it, some don't, but a station is 100 linear feet. So a lot of times we use stations to mark linear distances along the roadway. So if I said we're going to start at station 50 plus 63, that's 50 stations or 50 100 foot sections plus 63 more feet. Um, all right, and then if I'm using stations and I want to find the distance between two stations, I'm going to disregard that plus sign and just do the math. So if I'm trying to figure out the distance between station 17 plus 35, I'm going to treat that as 1,735 feet from the beginning and then go to station 25 plus 79. So remove that plus sign and right up here on the right side, you see 2579 minus 1735. That's a distance of 844 feet, or I could call that 8.44 stations or 8 plus 44. So lots of different ways to, to note that. Just wanted you to see that and, and know what that's about. Okay, then the other metrics that we're going to be talking a lot about are the tonnage, the area, and the rate of paving. Now the weight of mix per area to provide the required thickness is our rate. So I said earlier, sometimes we have a specification that requires us to place say a two inch overlay or a two and a half inch overlay. Sometimes we don't put it in terms of thickness, we'll put it in terms of rate and that will be pounds per square yard. So um, SY is square yard. And generally we're gonna assign a value of 110 pounds per square yard to be equivalent to one inch of thickness. So that will be a conversion that we use. Um, we'll talk about the weight of the mix and since our rate is pounds per square yard, we need that in pounds, but when you order mix from the plant, you're talking about tonnage. So we need to know that 2,000 pounds is equivalent to one ton of mix. We also talk about length and width in terms of feet, but our rate wants to know how many pounds per square yard. So I gotta take my feet and convert that to square yards. So I take my length times width, both of those in feet, and then my conversion factor is going to be nine because there's three feet in a yard and I've got two dimensions of that. So in effect, I'm going to take length times width and divide by nine to find my square yards. Now application rate, if I put all of that together, I need, I have tons. If I know length and width, then I'm going to put that 2000 and the nine together as my conversion factors, and I end up taking the tonnage times 18,000, and then divide both by the length and the width in terms of feet. Okay, so let's do one. If we're trying to find tonnage, and we know the length and the width of paving, and we know the rate, then I can use this form of the equation. I'm going to take the rate times length times width, and divide by 18,000. If the area and the rate are known, then I just rearrange all of that and I solve for the weight. So that means I'm gonna take the rate times the area in square yards and divide by 2000. If I'm finding the length of paving and I know the width of the mat, the rate and the tonnage, then I can take that tonnage times by 18,000, divide by the rate and divide by the width. So what I'm showing you right now is just different forms of the same relationship. Just we know some things and we got to pick the one thing we want to know. So if you look in the handout that is in your handouts pod, you can download that. There are some worksheets that will step you through this. So you can look at that later um, and we'll just keep on going through these examples. So to calculate tonnage, let's say that we need to calculate the tonnage needed for a two inch overlay of a one and a half mile section of a two lane roadway. Each lane is 12 foot in width and there are no shoulders. So we're paving two lanes, each one's 12 foot. I know the rate. Do I know the rate? It doesn't really tell me the rate, but I do know that it's a two inch overlay 
and that for each inch of asphalt, I can assume a rate of 110 pounds per square yard. So if it's two inches, that's gonna be 220. So in essence, I do actually know the rate. I'm told the length and I'm told the width. So let's find the tonnage. Okay, so if I put in 220 pounds per square yard for the rate, one and a half miles is length, but when we put this in, we need it in feet. So I've got to convert one and a half miles to how many feet. So I know that there's 5,280 feet per mile. So I'm going to multiply that also. And then the width, it was 12 foot lanes, but there are two lanes. So that's a total of 24 feet wide. And divide by 18,000, I get a total of 2,323 tons. All right, um, we've got the same situation here, but I wanna show you another little shortcut. Some agencies use this, some don't like it. I think it's pretty handy, but this is when you talk about asphalt more in terms of inches of depth than pounds per square yard of rate. So if you wanted to know the number of tonnage or the tonnage, number of tons, you would take your length times your width times your thickness in inches. So feet, feet, and inches and then put all the conversion factors together, multiply that by 0 0.00611, that gives you the number of tons that you're gonna need for that. So if we run that calculation, because the question did actually say two inches. So if I run that, I get the same answer, 2,323 tons. So same thing, just using a different format to make that calculation. Okay, now maybe instead of calculating tonnage, we want to calculate the length. If I'm paving, let's say, a 14-foot wide lane, and I'm given a rate of 275 pounds per square yard, what distance can be paved by 900 tons? And this is handy to know, like if the plant says, yeah, I can give you some mix, but I'm also supplying another job, and I can give you this much on this day. How far is that going to go? How is that going to fit in with your construction schedule? Okay, so in this example, we know the width, we know the rate, we know the tonnage, and we're trying to find the length. So we're going to use the rearranged version of that same calculation. Take our tonnage times 18,000, divide by the rate, and divide by the width, and I get a length of 4,208 feet. That's about four-fifths of a mile. All right, and then we can do the same thing with that other version where we use the factor of 0 0.00611. In this case, we weren't really given inches, but if you know that one inch of thickness is equivalent to 110 pounds per square yard, we can also make it work this way. So that 275 is basically two and a half inches of thickness. So we plug in this version of the formula, we've got 900 tons, we're going to divide that by our 14 foot width, two and a half inch thickness, and then use our 0 0.00611 factor and come out with the same answer of 4,208 feet. All right, any questions? Yes, we have had one question uh, come through and it was right at the beginning of this before we went into the math, but um, what would be the best type of rollers to use along roads with steep inclines? Cool. Um, I think for compaction, you still need to use your vibratory rollers to get that impact for your breakdown rolling. Um, and again, it depends on the paver and the screed and what kind of compaction you get out from the back of the screed. But um, be very careful, pay close attention to see how that vibration is impacting if you are seeing the mix move. If you're on a steep incline, because asphalt is a flexible material, it will tend to move a little bit. So if you have any issues with a tender mix or you see that the roller is pushing mix down the hill, so to speak, that's not going to be so great. So sometimes changing that amplitude, uh, try to lower that as much as possible so you're not beating it and pushing it downhill. That would be my advice on that. 
Okay, and then one more that's just come through. How do you know when to start rolling after placement with paver? Just as quick as you can get on it. So uh, for the breakdown roller, you are gonna try to stay up with the paver. And in the, the webinar next week will be the second half of this topic. And we'll actually look more at that and what your, what your range can be for your rolling patterns. Um, but generally, you want to get as much compaction you can as you can when it's as hot as possible, which is going to be straight out behind the paver. So keeping that breakdown roller up with the paver is going to be your best option. Now, occasionally there is some sensitivity in a certain temperature range, and it just varies mix to mix. You typically don't know that it's going to happen until it happens, and you'll see that a mix is tender and the, the roller's kind of pushing it around. That's the only time that I would say back off let it cool, say five, 10 degrees, try it again, see if that's still happening. Um, but there, there are some mixes that are a little bit temperature sensitive. So there's a range, kind of a, a, a tender zone, so to speak. You want to avoid that. But again, you're not gonna know that until you see it happen in the field. Okay, and a few more continuing to come through. Should vibration ever be used on the finish roller? Um, it would be a very rare case where I would recommend any vibration there. Generally, when you get to finish rolling, you should have just about all of the compaction percentage that you're going to get. And at that point, you're really just trying to take those roller marks out and make sure that it's as smooth as possible. That's the finished product that the traffic is going to see. That's what you know your users are going to feel. So the finish rolling is just like the artwork at the end of the process, but the actual compaction work has generally already been done at that point. You might get a couple of tenths of a percent more, uh, but you won't get much more than that. So I would Man. not use the vibratory mode for finish. Okay, and uh, one calculation question. Um, in your asphalt tonnage calculations, are you assuming the mat is 100% compact? No. Um, now, in the, the tonnage calculations, what we're saying is here's how much weight that we're putting in that particular area. And that does not really consider any of that density. Now, the only thing that one conversion that we did where we said that one inch is equal to 110 pounds per square yard, that is an assumption of that mix being compacted to a typical completed field density, which is going to be somewhere around 92 to 93 percent. Every mix is a little bit different. The denser your aggregates are, the denser your mix will be. And so that number is an assumption that is used kind of industry-wide, and it may or may not be exactly right for your particular mix. So you could actually calculate that out for your materials and know if that's an overestimate or an underestimate. Uh, but I think on average, it's a pretty good assumption to, to get your rates. Okay, that looks like that's everything that we have at the moment. All right. Well, at this point, I've got some questions for you. So let me pull this one up. I'm going to launch a poll, and this will be a question for you where we're going, uh, let's looking at stations. If we're paving from station 920 plus 75 to station 973 plus 55, how many linear feet is that? All right, let's get those answers wrapped up. Give me a couple more seconds. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. And the way to work this one is to just take those numbers. Uh, we have 973.55, and we're going to subtract the beginning station, which is 920.75. And the difference in those two numbers gives us 5,280 feet, which happens to be exactly one mile. So there's 52.8 stations between those two points, or 5,280 feet. That looks like most everybody got that one correct. So good job. All right, the next one, if we have that length 
of 5,280 feet. Uh, let's say that we've got two 12-foot lanes. What is the area that's going to be paved in terms of square yards? So we know the length is 5,280. We know the width is 12 foot, but there's two lanes. Uh, what is the area to be paved in square yards? So I'll give you a minute to run that calculation. All right, looks like our answers are slowing down a bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll. Okay, so for the length of 5,280 feet, we've got two 12 foot lanes. What is the area to be paved in square yards? So we're gonna take our length times our width, and our length is 5280, our width is actually 24. We've got 12 foot lanes, but there are two of them. So we've got 12 times two, and then we divide that by nine to convert our feet to yards, and we get a total of 14,080 square yards. And that was by far the most popular answer, so great job. All right, next, let's launch this one. And this one says, what is the paving rate if you've got 1,550 tons to be placed on that area of 14,080 square yards? All right, we want pounds per square yard. We're given tonnage and we are given square yards. There we are. All right, so our paving rate's 1,500, we're finding the paving rate. We've got 1,550 tons. And so we've got to convert the tons to pounds because our rate is given in pounds per square yard. So I'll multiply that by 2,000 and then divide by that area that we figured up that was 14,080. And that gives us a total of 220 pounds per square yard. So knowing that 110 pounds per square yard is approximately equivalent to one inch of thickness. This is about a two inch thickness, which is a typical overlay. All right, now we're gonna work through some more calculations uh, given a situation. So let's say that today we've got 800 tons of surface mix to be placed on a roadway and we're gonna estimate that we need about an hour for startup, another hour for cleanup at the end of the day, and my crew does not wanna work any overtime, so that leaves us six hours today for paving. The paving width is 12 feet. The target map thickness is two inches, and that's gonna be a rate of about 220 pounds per square yard. And what I need to do is balance the paving process by calculating the number of trucks needed the production rate, the paving rate, compaction rate, and our uh, figuring out how our, our rolling patterns are gonna be. Um, it actually gives us a rolling pattern, but we need to make sure and figure out how many rollers we need and how to balance that. So what it tells me is that I need three passes in vibratory mode and then two static passes with the finish rollers. So that's gonna represent my breakdown and my finish roller. Both of my rollers are dual drum steel wheel rollers that are six feet wide. All right, so let's start out looking at our trucks and our delivery. So we said that we have 800 tons that we can place, and I'm going to end up with six hours to do that. So first of all, is that even feasible? Well, 800 tons divided by six hours is 133 tons per hour. So the first question is, can the plant do that? And yes, that's easily doable for most any plant. However, if you are not the only job that that plant is providing mix for that day, you need to make sure that you can get that quantity on that day. So just because a plant can do something doesn't mean they'll give it to your project. Uh, they may have multiple things going, so keep that in mind. And then let's say that our average truck capacity is 15 tons. So I need to figure out how many trips is it gonna take for trucks to get the material from the plant and bring it out to the job. Well, I've got 800 tons total. Each truck is gonna hold 15, so that's a total of 53.3 truckloads, but you don't really want a third of a truckload. 
So we're just going to round up because that will make 54 total trips. Now I need to figure out how long is a trip. What is that cycle of the truck path from the plant to the site and then back to the plant? Well, there's a lot of things that go on there, so we're just going to estimate. So let's say that there's a lot going on at that plant today, and I might have to wait, say, 10 minutes for to be able to load, and then maybe 10 minutes loading time, then another five minutes to ticket and tarp, and then how far is it to the job site? How long is that going to take? Different times of the day will be you know, like rush hours different from two o'clock in the afternoon, but also consider that you have construction traffic because of the job that you're actually doing. So the trucks are trying to get to the same location where you are likely to have a backup of traffic anyway. Then once the truck gets to the job site, um, maybe they wait 10 minutes before they load in the paver and then the dump out, clean up, say 10 minutes, and then 15 minutes to return to the plant. A lot of times it's faster to get back to the plant than it is to get from the plant to the job site. Um, so these are made up, this is an estimate, and let's say that total cycle time ends up being 80 minutes for all of those things to happen. So 80 minutes per trip, that is 1.3 hours per trip, and we've got six hours to work with. So six divided by our 1.33 hours per trip means I'm going to get four and a half trips per truck. Um, so maybe round down to be on the conservative side. So if I have 54 total trips that need to happen and I can get about four trips per truck today, that's 13 and a half trucks that are needed. Again, you don't have half trucks, so let's round up to 14. Now, what I did not put in there was time for the driver to take a break, go get lunch, um, all those things that might also happen during the day. So any bonus time that you add on there, just kind of keep in mind what's realistic. Um, so anyway, 14 total trucks that are needed. Now, when you order your trucks, if you think you might not have the driver reliability, you might order 15 or 16 trucks just in case somebody doesn't show up or have someone on standby that can drive another truck. All right, so paving rate. What is the paving rate in feet per minute? Well, we've got tonnage, got our width, we've got thickness, and we use that calculation. We're gonna figure out how far will those tons go? Well, in an hour, we need to place 133 and a third. So divided by our 12 foot lanes, two lanes, use our conversion factor, what we see is that we're gonna end up placing 909 feet every hour. So what does that mean in terms of feet per minute? Divide by 60, and that tells me my paver is gonna be moving at 15 feet per minute. Is that reasonable? So does that work for your paver your crew, is that reasonable and typical of what you can do? So just a sanity check there, but this is what we can expect uh, given the number of hours and the number of tons that we need to place. That means our paver needs to go 15 feet per minute. Okay, and that should be doable. Now we need to check that against our rolling pattern and see what we need in terms of rollers. So breakdown, we said we needed three coverages, the finish was two coverages with a static roller. So let's look at what happens here during rolling. When you roll, you go forward a certain distance, you get up close to the paver, and then you back up, you go the other direction. So you're rolling back and forth. And when you, when you change direction, you have to slow down a little bit. And so you lose about 10% of your efficiency due to, or 10% loss of speed due to change in direction. So typically what we're gonna see for a breakdown roller is you should not go faster than three miles per hour. Something between two and three miles per hour is good. And also remember that you're trying to achieve 10 to 12 impacts per foot in vibratory mode. So by not going too fast, you're not gonna 
below your chance to get a high enough frequency. Okay. All right. So now let's look at how let's think through the coverages and how many times we have to go back and forth. Well, one of the disappointing things is that my roller was only six feet wide. However, when you are actually compacting, your effective drum width is about six inches less than the width of the drum. So we only get about five and a half feet of good compacted width and our paving width is 12. So we didn't quite make the cut to do this and to do one coverage in two passes. So it turns out that it's gonna take me three passes to get a complete coverage. And then for my breakdown roller, it said I needed three coverages. So three coverages times three passes it's a total of nine passes with the breakdown roller. Now, keep in mind, we want an odd number here because your first time you go forward, that's one. You back up, that's two passes. You go forward, that's three. And you notice that every time you're on an even number, you're back at the starting point. Well, to do any more compacting further down the road, you gotta move back forward. So we always need to see an odd number here. Even if it's not necessary, you'll end up with that odd number. Now, there are also some efficiencies. We lose a little bit of efficiency, not just on speed, but also just kind of the overall process of having to stop and refill the water tank, things like that. So a typical roller efficiency that's used in these calculations is somewhere between 75 and 80%. We're gonna use that as a decimal. I say we're pretty good, so we're gonna hit the 0.8 and we're gonna calculate an effective compaction rate. So the effective speed times the roller efficiency times or divided by the total number of passes, it's gonna tell us how much forward progress we can make with that breakdown roller. So if we said two and a half miles per hour would be our speed for breakdown, two and a half miles per hour is in the second row of the table we're gonna lose 10% of our speed for reversal factor, and that gives us an effective speed of 198 feet per minute, which is 2.3 miles per hour. Well, in this calculation, I want the feet per minute, so I'm gonna plug in this 198 up here, times that by the 0.8 efficiency, and then that was nine passes to get complete coverage for all of the passes of the breakdown roller. So that tells us that our breakdown roller can move forward at an overall rate of 17.6 feet per minute. All right, now we're gonna look at our finish roller. The finish roller typically can go faster. It can go three to five miles an hour. Um, all right, and we said we needed two coverages in our rolling pattern to get density or to, to finish out everything. So the finished total number of passes is two coverages and three passes, which we already figured, assuming this is also a six foot drum. That gives us six, but it's gotta be an odd number. So we bump that up to seven. And then we know that our compaction rate, our finish roller can go a little faster. So if I look at that and say three and a half miles per hour for the finish roller, reduce that by 10%, that is 277 feet per minute times my efficiency of 80% and divide by the seven overall passes gives me 31.7 feet per minute for the finish roller. All right, so in summary, what we've ended up with is that our plant can go 133 tons per hour. We are able to get that from the plant. We needed 14 trucks to make all this happen. Our paver is gonna be moving at 15 feet per minute. And then what I'm checking here is that the breakdown roller, can one breakdown roller keep up with the paver at 15 feet per minute? It can, at 17.6. And then our finish roller is actually almost twice as fast, so that guy's gonna be moving quick. So we've got our finish roller happening, no problems there. So if I have one paper, one breakdown, and one finish roller, and 14 trucks, I should be able to keep up with everything and get this project done. All right, 
Any questions? I feel like there are some. Okay, yes, we have had some come through. Um, one, towards the beginning of this, if the finished mat should be two inches after compaction, how thick should it initially be placed out of the paper? All right, that is going to depend a little bit on your paver and the weight of your screed, but in general, you should be able to estimate that you're going to get about 20% roll down, which is essentially saying that you're expecting 80% compaction out, out of the screed. So a 20% overage means that after you roll it down, you will end up at your target thickness. So 20% is a good rule of thumb. Okay, then a question, why is the effective drum width actual width negative six inches? Okay, so you subtract the six inches off because you don't get the same value of compaction right out at the edges of the drum. So the outer, say three inches on each side, you don't, you don't have the same level of confinement that you do under the middle portion of the drum. So you lose just a little bit on the edges. Now, in reality, could you probably make that work without having to go crazy and take that? just slightly over two passes to get a coverage. Could you get that all down? Depends on how effective your compaction is, how appropriate your temperature is to get compaction. Um, but you do lo lose a little bit of the effective, uh, good compactive area under the drum just because of that unconfined edge. Okay. And what is your recommendation when paving two lanes with only one paving machine where the joint between the two mats is not a bad cold joint? Um, yeah, generally this is how we have to do it just because of traffic considerations. So um, you're gonna pave one lane and then that is gonna cool down. You will end up having a longitudinal joint when you come back to do the second lane. Um, so you've got your one paver. If you've got a good cold joint or, you know, the, the cold side is in pretty good shape, you can get a decent, um, well, actually talk about that next week. We'll look at a lot of different uh, rolling patterns, ways to get a good longitudinal joint. I've got a whole section on that. But if you are not getting good compaction at the joint, uh, there are several things you could look at. One of those is cutting back the joint. Um, so that's a possibility. So stay tuned on that. Okay, and one more that's just come through. What are your thoughts on VRAM and polypropylene fibers? Um, just so I'm not misspeaking, can you type in what is what you're talking about on VRAM? But on on the fibers. Fibers are, uh, there's a lot of research that shows the fibers to be pretty good. Not all of them do a whole lot for you. Um, okay, that membrane. The void, VRAM is the void reducing asphalt membrane. I don't know, I don't think it's magical. I don't think it's a bad thing. I'm not sure. I think there are situations where it helps, um, but I don't think that's so magical. The fibers, if you have a mix that is prone to some movement, the fibers tend to stiffen it up a little bit. So it can it can be great. It is going to give you a little bit more um, interconnectivity between the parts of the mix. Sometimes if you have a good aggregate source that's got a lot of angularity and a lot of texture to it, you're going to have a lot of that anyway. Um, but if you are seeing problems, with some of the cracking or maybe a little bit of you know, soft spots, those fibers can help bridge that. It will not work in every situation, but I have seen quite a bit of research that is very complementary of some of the fibers. It's also an extra cost though, so kind of a trade-off and some people say, yeah, it works decently, but I don't wanna pay for it. So there's that. Okay, and we had one more. Due to the weather, uh, or excuse me, do the weather conditions affect how fast the machines work or the solubility of the material only? Weather conditions definitely have an impact. Um, it's really all due to temperature. 
and how that temperature affects the mix. So it really is temperature that's the impact. But if you have a hot sunny day with no wind, you're going to maintain that temperature for a much longer time frame. If you've got a cooler day, um, maybe cool, damp conditions, or if it's windy, if it's cloudy, cloudy and sunny give you totally different kinds of things. Um, it, it really is going to be based mostly on the temperature there. All right, I believe that covers everything we have at the moment. All right, super. Well, we've got just a few more things to go over. Um, I do have a poll question that I'm going to pop up here for you. All right, so here is a question. This is a what do you think kind of a question. The paving rate is 18 feet per minute. We've got two, ro two rollers, one breakdown, one finish. What could you do if a roller breaks down? Okay, so one option would be to get more trucks. One option would be to stop the paver. We could increase the plant temperature or we could reduce the paver speed. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close that one. So if we look at the choices, uh, one was to get more trucks. If we get more trucks, that's actually going to bring more mix there. And what's happening is when the roller breaks down, it's a, oh no, we got a problem, we got to fix this. So unless you just happen to have a spare roller on standby over there nearby, then there will not be a seamless transition, but you're going to have to do something. Bringing in more trucks of material is going to make things speed up, which we don't want to do at this point. Um, what we tend to do when something goes wrong is to stop the paver and let's get everything fixed and then we'll start up again. But we'll see next time stopping the paver really is about the last thing that you want to do. It's going to create a bump in the road. Increasing the plant temperature is a thought, but if you increase the temperature and you get outside of that prescribed mixing temperature, then you're going to have a different behavior. You're going to kind of cook those chemicals a little bit differently, things won't behave the same. So I would not recommend that, even though it seems reasonable to give yourself a little more time in getting to the job site and getting everything, you know, kind of buy some time to get compaction before it gets too cool. Um, what I would recommend is to reduce the paver speed. And the reason for that is we don't want to stop the paver, but if I can slow down enough, you know, in that calculation that we did, we saw that the finish roller, um, it could go about twice as fast as the breakdown roller. The breakdown roller is the one doing the most work. So in a perfect world, what I would like to see there is that we slow the paver down and then the roller that is still working, if both are still uh, have steel drums, vibratory modes, then we just pick up with the other roller to get the breakdown rolling done and if the paver slows down, then maybe I can get all of the passes by switching from vibratory to static mode and get all of that compaction done with one roller until I can kind of shut down for the day or bring in another roller, or do something to fix that issue. But slowing things down without stopping gives you a chance to adjust a little. All right, good job. So now we're going to talk a little more about preparation immediately prior to the paving project. One of the most important things is the pre-construction meeting. So making sure that everyone is on board, they've reviewed the project documents, the specifications, the plans, special provisions, any guidelines that you implement for your agency. Very important also to talk about the traffic control plan. How are you going to manage traffic during this process. So thinking about where are the trucks going to go. If you've got 14 trucks in process, you could feasibly have three or four on site at any given time. Where are they going to go? How are you going to maintain access to driveways and lane closures, all that sort of stuff? And then what are the lines of communication? I think this is huge when you're not doing the work in-house. So you've got the agency as the owner, you've got a contractor that's actually doing the work, um, who's in charge, who makes what decisions, and who is the point of contact? How do you coordinate schedules? Who are the, the main folks that need to be in communication, and how does that communication disseminate to the other 
uh, crew members that are involved. Um, think about your lift thicknesses, your, your mix design, making sure everybody's on board and knows we need to be checking the tickets. When the truck comes out of the plant, check the ticket. Make sure that truck contains the correct mix for that job site. Uh, when you've got silos with multiple mixes at a plant, it can get a little tricky. So just make sure you're getting what you thought you were getting. Make sure everyone's aware of what that desired lift thickness is. Think about the layout of your pools. Uh, which lane you're going to do when, how you can structure the whole sequence of events, maybe to make things a little bit easier on traffic. Um, in any unusual circumstances, is there something different like, oh, we've got to have this section done because our annual fall festival is happening and this road is used a lot you know, in this area, something like that. Anything that's unusual needs to be talked about beforehand. Try to come up with any what ifs. Talk all of that through so that you don't have surprises after the job has started. It's very important for this process to run consistently and get all the paving going off without a hitch. So no surprises is a good thing. Now, another thing to look at is, this is kind of backing up a little bit, but why are you doing this project? Is it resurfacing just because it's time? Are there specific problems? And if there are specific problems, are any of those related to drainage? When you do pavement design, the, the most important things are drainage, drainage, and more drainage. So if there is something that you can fix relative to drainage before you do this paving project, by all means, do it. Paving over a drainage problem may look good for a little while. It's not going to last forever. The drainage issues will always win. So if there is something that could be done, do it before you spend the money on the paving project. All right, and then we're going to be considering subgrade. If this is not an overlay and we've got a full depth construction, um, the subgrade is really the foundation of our pavement structure. So we need to make sure that it's in good shape. We can bridge over some things, but they usually will reflect through and we will see them again. So Right now, while you have access to the subgrade, this is the time to fix anything that needs to be fixed, any soft spots. Um, if you can do some, some testing, uh, nuclear density testing, subgrade is in Arkansas anyway for state projects, is subject to a minimum compaction level of 95%. Um, if you don't have access to that equipment or can't do that testing, at a minimum, do some proof rolling. That's a visual check where you're gonna take the heaviest vehicle available and you're gonna put it on that subgrade. And if everything is stable and looks like it's not moving at all, that's great. If you see a wave of material kind of humping up in front of the tires, you've got, you've got some more work to do. So we don't wanna see that wave in front of that heavy truck. So again, fix anything that you can before you cover it up and make it hard to get to. Then your next layer will be your base. If you're using an aggregate base, that should be a dense graded crushed aggregate, uh, maybe up to 12% fines, but that's gonna be a good dense graded material that's gonna lock together and give us a really stiff foundation. This is gonna be right beneath the asphalt. So um, for Arkansas state specs, 98% is the minimum density requirement. Again, if you can test that with a, a density gauge or something to get an actual number, wonderful. If not, at least do your proof rolling and also look for segregation. If you see patches of material, like in this picture, we've got the red arrow over here. You can see this is a coarser uh, texture. Over here on the left side, it's a much finer texture. Well, that's not the same all the way across. We want it to look all the same. If your base is smooth and consistent, you've got a much better shot at your pavement being smooth and consistent. If you need to repair any base failures, do those dig outs, uh, correct that. Again, before you try to cover it up, it's much cheaper to do it while it's exposed. And it's just a couple more pictures of that, making sure that the entire affected area gets taken care of before we pave over it. And if you have a lot of cracking, you're doing an overlay, seal those cracks. Um, make sure that you don't seal 
too close to the time of paving, depending on the material, some of those sealants will swell with heat and that will create some issues. Um, you don't want to see that. And then leveling, we can prepare for this because we know that whatever we're paving on, that shape will eventually reflect through our surface layer. So if we can put a, a leveling course on to make sure that that's smoothed out before we pave on it, I've got a better shot at getting a nice smooth surface. Utility cuts are going to fall in that category. It's hard to pave over them and have the same density at this utility cut area. And sometimes instead of filling in the low spots, we want to cut down the high spots. So that would be milling the surface. Again, another way to improve that smoothness. And millings can be used as recycled material in another paving mix. And then make sure it's all clean. Brush it, sweep it, make sure we don't have crumbs on the surface before we get ready to start. If you're doing night paving, talk about that in your pre-construction meeting. Make sure you have enough lighting to be able to see and do all of the things that you would normally do in the daytime. Talk through your traffic control. Okay, worker safety is extremely important. We want to make sure that we're not asking drivers to do anything confusing or more difficult than what they would normally do on the, the roadway when it's not under construction. So keep that in mind. And then I do have a reference here to a work zone traffic or work zone safety app. Um, this is the little icon, at least on an iPhone, that's what it looks like. But this is a great tool to help you at least double check your work zone safety plan. How many barrels, how are you do your, your spacings, merge, lane shift, handling shoulders, all that kind of thing. So just wanted to put a plug in for that. And that is all I have. So if there are any other questions, uh, just let me know. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys sign off. We're a minute or so after. You should get an evaluation after you close the, uh, the presentation. If you don't get that, hopefully it will come to you by email. And I would love to hear your thoughts and hope to see you next week for part two. Thanks so much and have a great day.